In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by viewers and listeners just like you. That's right, Bob. Now, the way we opened this episode today was with a 30-minute introductory portion. So we didn't answer fitness questions in the first 38 minutes, but we did talk about current events. We talked about scientific studies, some cool stuff uh, in that first 38 minutes. But if you want to just skip to the fitness questions... That's 38 minutes later. You're a skipper. So I'm going to give you the whole breakdown of today's episode. We open up by talking about The Rock. He bought the XFL for $15 million. Sounds like a steal, Yeah. if you ask me. People's eyebrow. Then we talked about the real estate market right now. Like the stock market, doesn't make any sense. I don't know what that means, but we'll see. Hmm. <laughs> then I talked about a study uh, showing, a very small study, showing that red light therapy can improve eyesight. Now, it's a small study, so take it with a grain of salt. But it's just another study that shows the potential benefits of red light therapy. Now, the established benefits are uh, it helps with wrinkles, stretch marks. It helps with uh, recovery of injuries, may have some effects on the metabolism through boosting the mitochondrial production of ATP. Might help so, regrow hair. Re what? Actually, that's established. It does help regrow hair. That's not a joke. Um, now, the company that we work with, Juve, in our opinion, makes the best red light devices you can find anywhere. They have the devices that are like the ones used in these studies. There are a lot of knockoffs. There are a lot of crappy products out there. Don't just get red light. Get the ones that actually work. So go to juve.com. That's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash mind pump and get the mind pump hookup. That means you'll get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more, free shipping, and 0% APR financing for some of their products for 12 months or for 18 months. There you go. You're welcome. Then we talked about the Artifact Company. This is a really interesting. You won't want to miss that one. Then we talked about conspiracy theories. I came up with a new one. Actually, I didn't. I got a meme that hmm. pointed me in that direction, so hold on to your hats. That one hurt my head. Then we talked about a new motor electric company called Lordstown. Um, and then I talked about fasting and the ketogenic diet. I'm trying to maximize my brain's performance right now, so I'm not so much focused on strength. I'm more focused on cognitive performance. This means I'm not eating any carbohydrates. I'm on a, a higher fat ketogenic diet. This is what works well for me. And I'm eating a lot of grass-fed meat. It has a better fatty acid profile, easier to digest. And my favorite company that delivers grass-fed meat to my door is ButcherBox. Now, we Best. have a massive hookup with ButcherBox right now. If you go to ButcherBox.com and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get some exclusive offers that are saved only for Mind Pump listeners. Then we got into answering the questions. Here's the first one. This person wants to know, if you can't get a full eight hours of sleep, should you take a nap during the day? Does that fix the problem? Does it help? What's the deal with that? Now, during that conversation, I talked about one of my hacks. I like to take a 20 or 30 minute nap during the day, but I use Brain FM. Brain FM plays uh, certain sounds and music that gets your brain into the sleeping wavelength. It actually gets me to sleep faster mm. and deeper, and then I wake up more refreshed. If you go to brain.fm forward slash mind pump, uh, we hooked you up with a discount and a free session, a free, excuse me, five session trial. Here's the next question. This person wants to know if, if it's hard for you to get enough food throughout the day, uh, what are some good ways to implement more food, like larger meals, snacks, shakes? Uh, what are your strategies? Just add cheese. The third question, what is your advice for someone who used to be chubby and now is scared to put on weight due to body dysmorphia? So we talk a little bit about body dysmorphia in that part of the episode. And the final question, this person wants to get into the fitness field as a career, but is uh, having cold feet, not sure if they should jump all the way in or start out as a side hustle. So we give our opinions on the current state of the fitness industry and if we think it's a good idea to jump all the way in or just test the waters with your big toe. Also, this month, all month long, MAPS Performance is 50% off. This is a great workout program for those of you that want to build muscle, speed up your metabolism, burn fat, but you like to do it with fun workouts. Mm. You like to do it with functional exercises. You don't just like to look good. You want to be able to move good. That's what MAPS Performance is all about. So it's got traditional and non-traditional exercises in it. It has a special emphasis on mobility. In fact, this is the only MAPS program 
with uh, mobility sessions specifically designed to improve the way that you move. This program is one of our most highly rated programs. We don't often put it on 50% off sale, but we are this month. Here's how you get that discount. Just go to mapsgreen.com. That's M-A-P-S-G-R-E-E-N.com and use the code GREEN50. That's G-R-E-E-N-5-0, no space, for the discount. Hey, I got a question for you uh, sports experts. Who oh, sports ball <laughs> trivia. Big news in sports these days. Well, you know how we were talking last time about how the ratings, that they were anticipated crazy ratings yeah. for oh, NBA, yeah. MLB. Wah, wah, wah. They got not what they anticipated, and then it dropped considerably. And we were speculating about you know what could have caused too that, whatever. Too political. Too political is what a lot of people are saying. It's too much, whatever. I know Brendan yeah. Schaub said the same thing uh, on his podcast. He thinks the same thing. That's why he... He thinks their, their ratings went down. But anyway, so for a while now, there's been, there there've been, and I, I say a while, over the last, I don't know, 20 years, there have been these competing leagues that have tried to compete with, you know, these 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 big league. Yeah, uh, the like, monsters. Yeah, like the NBA, MLB, the NFL, right? Like XFL. Remember, the XFL has been tried a couple times. Oh, yeah. Could not compete because nobody wants to leave the NFL. Do you think it's prime now? Do you think it's prime now to compete with these leagues? No. You still don't think so? No, I don't. Because I, I heard I, the Rock. The Rock bought XFL for fifteen million, I believe. Maybe Doug could double check my numbers. That seems which cheap. It is cheap to me. That seems like it's inexpensive. Yeah, especially for, million, especially for the Rock. That's like a month's you know, months pay. Like he went through yeah. the ca- he went through the couch cushions. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'll just buy this thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, I got fifteen million. Right. right. He might have just bought it for the URL. So you so you still don't think it's like like, like let's no. say no, oh, I really? don't. No, it's, how come? I just because those brands have have established themselves so well. I mean, there's people all over the world that migrate to the United States to play in those leagues, bro. Mm-hmm. It's not just here in the United States that those brands are big. They are they're continuing they're to international grow. brands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if they keep losing, of course, they could always It doesn't matter, you know, you know why? Because even if it, it even if it's awesome, right? It'll always play second fiddle to those brands and it'll be scoffed at. It'll be yeah. like, "Oh, it's the XFL." You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're good in the XFL. That's cool. It's it's uh, so it won't. It's kind of similar. It's kind of similar to how how Division One athletes look at Division Two athletes. Mm. Like my good buddy could have went to a Division One school, but he he would have had to redshirt, and even then he would have fought for a starting position, or he could have went to D two and been a fucking stud. Yeah. And none of you know who he he was. He was one of the, he was leader in sacks and interceptions. He was a badass in D two. Didn't go to the NFL afterwards. Mm-hmm. Nobody, it nobody. It does happen, but yeah, it's it's, it's rare, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, I could see that too. And also with like the UFC versus something like a Strike Force uh, back in the day, you know, that's kind of like a, a, in terms of like them being able to get the the top talent, they're always going to go to the UFC. Okay, well, so here's my question then. Okay, so, it'll be a feeder league at best. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, fine, they can't. They're not going to surpass even if the NFL. Let's say all these big leagues uh, just continue to tank. I think they could always pivot out of it, but let's just say they keep continuing to tank. You still think XFL wouldn't beat them, but what would be their role? What place? How would you make it successful? You well, know what I'm saying? so, okay, is there money to potentially be made there? Okay, maybe. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to run a business like that where it's like they where the the NFL is going to poach all your best players, just like I think Justin just said it right with the like with uh, UFC. You're, they're gonna you're gonna all these other leagues that could potentially compete with these they'll never compete they'll just end up being feeder leagues mm-hmm. because they have so much money they're they can't they can't hang they can't give contracts like what was just given mm. to, uh, to malone i mean you you can't give a contract like that yeah yeah mahomes just got like a what was the what was the number that mahomes 504 million yeah like like, yeah. A, like a half a billion dollar contract wow like yeah, yeah the, whole ex, the whole xfl the whole xfl league won't yeah. even be worth that yeah, exactly it's worth 15 million it's a you know sneeze saying? you yeah. can't you can't have a 15 million dollar league and pay an athlete a half a billion dollars <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying that's hilarious yeah, yeah it's, it's not even on the same planet it's right it's yeah. comical Right, and and what will happen is, you know, even let's say they then there's a lot of guys coming in a D two or even D one that didn't make it to the pros. 
that would love an opportunity to go play just like arena football. Arena, arena football, football is a thing. Yeah, the Canadian League. Yeah. You know, there's there's actually leagues over in Europe too that that do uh you know some bit of football, but yeah, yeah at best it's going to be kind of like an arena football kind of entertainment thing. And I heard, like, actually that when they relaunched the XFL, it was picking up a bit more steam than it did the first time around. So maybe that's where The Rock had interest was like, well, oh, well, it so, had a little bit of traction. Okay, this so time. what I think they did smart the second time around was they didn't try and compete with the NFL season. So yes. there's some people and which that then it has a place to have like a little market there. Like, you know, there's people that are such diehard NFL fans or just football in general. Yeah, football in general, that when the NFL season is over, they still want their football. Yeah. And if they can watch another league, then OK. Well, the timing may be good for them to get uh, more eyes, though. Right. Because if you're watching one of these big leagues and you're one of the people that got turned off for whatever reason, we were speculating it yeah. was too political. It could be whatever whatever reason. It's turning people off. If they're agnostic or whatever politically, I feel like that would be the best thing he could do. Yeah, and maybe it'll, I mean, uh, not beat the NFL, but maybe bring uh, enough eyes to it to where it brings the value up and gets some interest. I, I don't mean, think that, could, that, that might be a good opportunity. I, the NFL didn't go as hard. The NBA, in my opinion, is the only one that went hard. Mm. The rest of them, I, the rest of them, I, I appreciate how they did it. It's a, you know, there was, there was a, there was a, yeah, it was a lot more subtle. In the MLB, there was a mix of guys that kneeled. There was a mix of guys that stood. Right. You know, there was they, they did the, the BLM on the mound. So there was a couple things in there, but it wasn't like as, it wasn't as heavy as the NBA. The NBA was like in your face about it. The entire mm. viewing, everything from what you were viewing, what you were listening to. Uh, you know, and then on top of that, the commercials that were being promoted during that time. So they, out of all the leagues, they went the hardest on that. I, the NFL, no, I don't, I don't see, uh, I don't, I don't know what Rock's angle is on this. Well, you know? fifteen million yeah. sounds so cheap. Of though, course, for it something is. like that. <laughs> yeah, it's probably always swooping in. Mean, well, think yeah. about it. He might be able to just double his money real quick right. and then and just then, sell merch and then yeah, dump no, it. Don't even do it. Well, yeah. yeah, at fifteen million, the idea of it being this kind of small feeder league could be worth it in itself. You know, yeah. building a, a decent league that is an opportunity. There's so many people that are coming out of college that probably get overlooked. You know, because a scout didn't see them, and oh, this yeah. could be an opportunity. They pay the players so a lot of guys that would love to go play football for a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know what I'm saying? Doing what you love with the opportunity of maybe making but yeah. it'll always be that. I do this XFL in hopes the NFL yeah. finds Pays attention me. to me. Yeah. Do you guys ever do you guys remember that women's football league where the lingerie football league? Was that what it was called? Yeah. So yeah. condescending. You yeah. know what was condescending about but it? That's how they, they knew they had to get views by doing something like well, that. Well here's the part that was funny to me. I've seen a couple of the games and the girls are Badasses. Oh yeah, yeah. Like they're they legit are, tackles. They're they're, oh, <laughs> they're violent. They're built like I mean monsters, and they're crushing each other. And they're, yeah. they're, but they're playing football <laughs> in like little yeah. bikinis. Like, what are you yeah. doing? It's silly. You know. Yeah. It is crazy to me that everything is so politicized. Sports, medicine is politicized. I'm watching this whole debate. I'm not going to get into you know what I think is right over hydrochloroquine. Since when has medicine been politicized? Isn't that strange? It's a new one. Yeah, that's the weirdest thing. I feel like medicine is just uh, here's the studies, it works and it doesn't, and you're the doctor, you decide. That's where I yeah, feel like it should be. There's a lot of sciences that are under attack these days. Uh, it's really interesting to see how like politics have, have bled through, just like you know all these different like studies of of science. I've seen it happen with nutrition. You know, I've been in fitness for for decades, and I've never seen nutrition be politicized. But all of a sudden, if you eat meat, you hate the environment. Right. Uh, and if you and so so you're either one way or the other, and it's like oh my gosh, and they they're, they politicize everything. It's poisoning everything. Biology, we, I mean, everything's up for for grabs. Yeah, pretty soon days. we can't talk about anything at all. Yeah, you know, I like, think everyone's just gonna look at 2020 as like a mulligan. It's just it just doesn't count. You know what I'm saying? It's just like fucking. That's just like the 13th. Every, floor. We yeah. swung hard and missed. Yeah, bro, yeah. it just doesn't even. The whole thing doesn't make sense. The stock market doesn't make sense. Real estate doesn't make sense right now. I can't wrap my brain around what we're seeing in real. estate state right now i mean i shared this you know, uh, prices generally went up a little bit they're expecting they are <laughs> that's there's that bidding wars sense. dude i, I went that's i told crazy. you guys the other day that i've been looking at properties and stuff and you know katrina and i oh we find this place oh we like this if we got it if we get it for that number then this makes sense right it's a smart halfway investment property stay mm -hmm. live there for a little bit type of deal and a bidding war 
I mean, and this house has shit that needs to be worked on still. And so I would normally look at a property like this and go like, okay, this is what they're asking. Drop it by twenty, thirty thousand oh. dollars contingent on all these things being or contingent on all these things being fixed. And what's happening, somebody else is coming over the top by fifty to a hundred thousand dollars for it. It just blows my mind when it, when we know that there is twenty eight million potential foreclosures right down the road for us. Like yeah. Well, that is so crazy. Now I understand that cash is cheap. Like I was just talking to somebody in DMs that in in Canada they're doing like one point three or one point five interest I, rates. I know dude. what? Yeah, I thought our two point five, two point six was insane. That's so, unheard of. Right. So cash is cheap. And so what we're seeing is opportunists and investors that are coming in all over the from everywhere that mm -hmm. are buying up these places. Yeah. But I mean, sooner or later, they even run out of money and they've bought all their investment properties. So when is this thing going to really reveal itself on what like the new reality is going to be in real estate? Just doesn't make yeah. sense. Uh, to me. Buckle your seatbelts. I, I know, know. Bi Bitcoin is up finally. Oh, remember, hey, remember, oh remember, told you, <laughs> motherfuckers. It's the long play. It's yeah. the long play. Finally well, made a dollar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We all got Bitcoin and it like went down. Yeah, but you forgot all your login. Right? Oh, dude, so, I don't even know my logins for it. No, I, you did him, I did, well, I have Katrina's got to save oh, some. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah, we got it somewhere. Because you know what happens? If That's you a can't, common thing I've heard from Yeah, people. if you can't get in, you're done. Yeah. There's yeah. no way to yeah. get. There was one guy. You I get it. I think I said this on the podcast. This one dude had like millions of dollars of Bitcoin because he bought it back when it was like dirt cheap. Yeah. yeah. And he wrote the, the codes down on a piece of paper and the, it lost the Forever paper. Forever gone. Yeah. Never, could never yeah. get, get his, uh, his I mean, money. I looked at it as gambling money Crazy. anyways. I told you guys that back then, you know, so it's, I'm not, you know, millions mm -hmm. or ten even tens of thousands invested. I mean, thousands of bucks in there. And, you know, if it turns into something, it turns into something. Dude, hey, I got to bring yeah. up a cool study that just came out. It's mm. a small study, very, very small study. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little disclaimer. Take it with a grain of salt. Okay. But this study used uh, red light therapy. And by the way, if you're listening and you have a juve red light, before you proceed with what I'm about to say, do your own research. See if you if this is okay. This is just the study that I read, right? So people using red light on their eyes, okay, looking into the red light for short periods of time, had improved eyesight from doing this. Wow. So they theorized. So the way red light therapy works is the the red light, there's particular wavelengths that you'll find in, in, the, in the right devices, right? So Juve does this. The, this particular wavelength hits the cells and it causes the mitochondria to produce more ATP. Remember, the mitochondria of cells are like the, like the engines uh, of the cell. They're the energy producers. And the more efficient they are, the you know better your muscles work, the faster your skin regenerates, the you know your hair grows better, you, you recover faster. If your mitochondria works better, you're going to think more clearly. And so that's essentially what the light was doing or what it does. And so they put it on their eyes in this particular study and people got better eyesight. Dude, that's interesting because I remember posting something when I wasn't wearing like eye protection and that was like in the comments, like I was getting hammered for that fact is like, oh, it's going to damage your eyes. No. But it, yeah, it, it, it honestly, uh, I mean, this really points to the fact that you need a, a real high quality uh, output uh, emitting type uh, light and mm -hmm. so that's uh, you know in, in terms of like shining it on your eyes because it, imagine if you had any kind of like uv or something damaging that and then you're trying to get the that uh, you know, benefit that the study's highlighting, and you're not using something with high. Quality. I'm so glad that my my uh, pediatrician was savvy to all the red light therapy. Like he encouraged me to use it uh, on Max. So I mean, and the way I use it is this: I use it. Just very, have them in the room. I yeah, I use it the very same way that I use like our. We talk about green juice on here. We talk all these the things that we. I look at it like a supplement, right? If I am, if I know that it was a day where I didn't get much good natural sunlight, where I didn't spend at least 20 minutes to an hour outside absorbing the sun, that's when I'm like in front of that light. Well, and if I have a consistent week where I'm spending, you know, I, we're going to the beach in two days, we'll be there for four days, I'll be out in the sun. I won't, I'm not worried about getting mm -hmm. my, my red light therapy. Right, right. So Jessica's using it on her belly because obviously she's now in the third trimester to prevent or help uh, with stretch marks, which it has mm. clinical applications. But, you know, here's the thing. Like we, we talked about creatine many, many times on the podcast. Creatine is by far one of the best supplements you can take across the board. Now lots of studies are showing its health benefits and people are actually starting to get it, to use it for wellness purposes. People who don't even care about building muscle and strength are taking creatine because it helps with cognition 
It helps with heart health. And the way creatine works is it helps your body produce more ATP, exactly what red light therapy does. Yeah. So shining this on the biggest organ on your in your body, get your mind out of the gutter, Justin, is your skin, hey. right? So. You stand in front of this with your Thanks skin. Thanks for acknowledging it. You're going to produce. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Yeah. You're going to produce a lot more uh, ATP in your body. So those that's going to give you some health benefits as a result of it. Wow, that is cool. You know, I was just reading something. Obviously, we're in the podcasting space. And uh, there's like all these different types of markets kind of popping up now that I'm paying uh, attention to. And there was this company that uh, I just read about that was trying to approach the really small like niche type uh, content that people are putting out. But specifically, they're kind of providing a service to basically capture like stories and things from family members and, um, you know, be able to, to, you know, produce something that's a high production and, and to have that uh, available. So they're like pitching it like your uncle has this crazy story from, uh, you know, back in the day or like Vietnam or, or whatever. And like, you're, you're getting this really like, like, crazy detailed uh, story like captured and they, they provide the service to address that. So uh, they charge, you know, a couple hundred bucks to kind of do this whole thing for people. But it's like almost like uh, this this audio catalog that like uh, they're going to try and pitch to people to start uh, a business with. Wait uh, a minute. So so you you would record a story and this service would put it together and save it and for start you. start creating like little micro like podcasts uh, with it. Oh, out of your... Out yeah. of your Artifact is what the, the company's called. Oh, that's kind of interesting. It's interesting. It reminds me too of like when you talked about like how cool it is now that we have kind of like a timeline, yeah. uh, you know, with social medias and whatnot. Like this is just another way, another service to kind of capture uh, these stories and uh, history with, with that's people. That's why, I, you know, okay, you watch, you left the room, right? You watched Archive with me, didn't you? Who who watched it all the way with me? Archive. That, that sci-fi movie that we watched up in Tahoe. Yes, I did. Yes. So, like, I really think that we are going to see this in our, and for sure in our lifetime, especially, and I think that uh, we especially are going to be examples of somebody they can use, right? So, Somebody who has got, you know, what are we at? 1,300, Doug, or 1,400 episodes of one hour to two hour. I mean, I've said every, every word in my lexicon that you could think of that I would ever use in my, in my daily speech, right? Mm -hmm. I've used everything in, in this podcast alone. You have YouTube where we've got recorded. We've got articles that we've written yeah. up. Everything. And it wouldn't you be, create an avatar of us. Yeah, already. you could build an algorithm around, you know, if you ask this question, what would be an answer that Sal would give with your voice because it's recorded? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be hard to build a virtual version of you that you can converse with. Why would this not be a business that when you go and you die, Creepy. that I have an opportunity as your, you know, someone who's related to you, to say, hey, I want to spend that, you know, ten thousand dollars to create a virtual sal that I can then communicate with. That do, don't think that's not coming. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that's for sure coming. That's really weird. Yeah, this is another step in that direction for sure. That's some really creepy stuff. So yeah. you basically, you know, someone dies and you're like, you know what? Yeah, uh, I want to hang I, out. With I want to talk with Nana. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. just like have a conversation, like uh, she's right there. I, you know, and so, see, for somebody who who lost his father when he was so young, who has very little of that, I would eat that up, dude. Mm. To be able to potentially communicate, even though it's a virtual version and people would think that's weird or I wouldn't want, like someone like me would 100, I would rather have that than what I have right now. Mm -hmm. Right now I have very little information that's related to him that I can't, I would love to know, does he think like me? If I asked him a question, I know how I would respond. Would he respond similar to me? Like, mm. are we alike? Would we have things that we get? I mean, all that stuff for someone like us, like your son's son will, will have that, I think for, you know, your, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. Now here's how I think this would be used. Would it, what if celebrities uh, pay to have companies do this for them? And then you could rent, you know, talking to the rock or whoever, you know, hey, do you want cooking lessons? Would you like to talk to, you know, <laughs> what's that guy's name? Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the dude in the restaurant? Emerald? Uh, uh, yeah, whatever. Emerald, whoever, right? Or the or, guy with the mullet. Yeah. Gordon Ramsay. Gordon yeah, Ramsay. there you go. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I mean, I could see that. Oh, you can sure. monetize that for That's, sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, oh, you want personal training from Adam Schaefer? You know, it's really you. Like, ah, you know, you suck. You know, yeah. your, your butt needs to get bigger or whatever. I think it's a say. family <laughs> thing. More, more so <laughs> than anything. I, I think it's like the future of how you'll, it, like, how you think of, think of it too if it was something like a 
funeral homes started to offer something like this, where um, imagine this uh, a one hour, two hour, five hour, whatever you want to think about, reel of Justin. Justin dies, you know, 50 years from now or whatever, and you go to his funeral home and it's a digital screen that I can click on and I can watch, you know, Justin's favorite moments, Justin sports, Justin family, ju- and and you're Justin's deepest that's secrets. Awkward. <laughs> yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean I mean don't you think that would Leaving be those rad? pictures in the shower. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> think of think of a family member that's passed for one of you guys. You don't think that would be so cool to be able to go and like I don't know, man, it's hard to wrap my mind yeah, around that. Yeah, it is. That. It's such a new thing that it's yeah, it is really hard to like uh, really visualize it. Super weird. Yeah. Speaking of weird, obviously we're in a weird time and conspiracy theories are just oh, I feel like boy. it's prime no no I don't got a new one well, okay. I can't, maybe maybe I do Ooh. so you know it's, it's it's like conspiracy theories are flying everywhere and Justin and I love for entertainment purposes we love yes. to sit down and share them and talk about them and we, we kind of filter it out that way and know? then and then I read this meme and then something dawned on me so I'm going to read you the meme and then I'll tell you what dawned on me so here's what the meme says it says just wait until conspiracy theorists discover they're part of a conspiracy yeah. to use conspiracy theorists to spread <laughs> disinformation. I got, I got somebody sent me that same meme via conspiracy theories. Yeah. So that's essentially what it's saying is, you know, uh, what if everybody's being manipulated by all these? And I started thinking, especially politically speaking, if you're on one side, you think that this is what's crazy and this is what's running the world. If you're on this side, you think, what if everybody's just being manipulated like crazy? Of yeah, course. I just feel like it's a big. What do you uh, mean? What if? cluster of chaos that they just like they're spreading out anything to to just get people like all over the place like they, you don't know where to go and to turn to for truth i mean yeah. what if to me that's dude i think you're naive if you think otherwise yeah. right i think you're naive if you don't there's so much money and power behind all this stuff that we're talking about to think that we're not all being manipulated and being well, no matter what you, I don't care who you subscribe to or what channel or what side you're on the political fence if you think that you are not somewhat being manipulated by yeah. the, the information that you're only getting read or fed I just follow money and people in power right. the, those are my two go-tos to see how the trends uh move in, in terms of world you know climate and also like what kind of policies are trying to be enacted well I just live by that 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 old saying of you know belief uh half of what you see and nothing that you hear mm. you know so it's just like i, I need to see it with my own eyes yeah. first of all and then even then i'm going to question it you know if it's even a reality or true especially if i see it on fucking social media then it's already fallen in the probably not real and if i hear it i don't believe it until i see it you it's know? just it's just yeah. crazy to me it's uh, and of course it makes sense you know if you're on if you're running one side you would want people to believe one type of conspiracy theory mm-hmm. or series of theories to discredit the other side and side and maybe create fear and the same thing happens for the other side don't think for a second. Well, I mean, I just, doing that. I just feel it stems back to getting people separated. I mean, like it's a very effective tactic uh, to spread misinformation to just get people like completely uh, consumed by their own bias, so they won't even listen to other conversations or change their mind or unify and collectively unite. So that way, that actually moves in the right direction. The more separated you can keep everybody, the worse off we're all going to be. Yeah, you know, you know what the antidote to that is is to be present and then just talk to the people around you yeah. and connect with real people in front of you and you'll find a totally their- different experience. Oh. And I'm sure you guys just go to like, I've everybody's so nice, like in person, you <laughs> yeah. go talk to them, doesn't matter what background they well, are. You know, Brennan Shaw brought something up because he, when he was talking about the whole NBA thing and professional sports and where it's going. And, you know, one of the points that he made that I wasn't even aware of is the, what percentage of people are actually on social media and he says that there's one in 50 people are only mm-hmm, on social media. Mm-hmm. And so right now, a lot of the conversations that we have and a lot of the the, the things that we share or we talk about are things that we're seeing on Twitter and Instagram. It just and seems Facebook. a lot louder and bigger than Right. It, it seems yeah. so, but it's not even the majority. It's it's not even it's not it's even these cl- little eruptions. Yeah, it's not even places. close to half the majority. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like it's it's a very small percentage of the population, and many of them are just loud. They're they're yeah. loud, obnoxious, regardless of what side they're on, and and I think taking that at face value and understanding that well, I'm not going to get myself caught in this bullshit because you're not even a representation of fucking real people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I meet real people every day, and when I talk to them, they're fucking fine. And most they're people, normal. Most people are reasonable. Right. Most people want safety. They want security. They want what's best for their family. 
They want opportunities. That's most people. And again, mm-hmm. most people are reasonable when you sit down and you can talk, uh, unless they're, everybody's riled up from social media. You have normal conversations. You can have good discussions. It feels good to, to go out into the real world and be present. And and we're not doing that as much as we, we usually do because we're all at home. Right. That's the frustration is, uh, you know, that other side of it is like this whole virus thing has really put a wedge in, in that even further. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I got something for you guys transitioning into business talk. So uh, keep an eye out for a company called Lordstown. Lordstown Motors, they're a elect right now, like the the electric car, you know, thing and especially electric trucks is becoming super competitive, right? You saw oh, yeah. Tesla Tesla, re- Tesla reveal oh, like the semi? Just no, just no, regular just trucks. Really, pickup yeah, pick trucks. Oh, yeah, okay. Tesla did theirs first, you know, GM and Ford's N- working Nicola. on theirs. Nicola or Nicole, however you say it, it there theirs coming out. Now this Lordstown, okay, also backed by GM. Was an old GM factory. They are they're backing them financially. This startup supposedly has the advantage to get to market before anybody else. Why? So I, just because they already had all the tools in place, mm. so they already had everything in place. That, and their their claim to fame with the truck is the 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 way each one of the wheels like so is electrically powered individually. So, so it's it has like four engines. Yes, mm. exactly. It's like mm. four engines built into these. So that's kind of like their claim to fame for what makes their truck special in comparison. But the real thing to watch for, I think the fact that it's going to hit market first is is just a huge advantage in itself. Forget all the you know, a- attributes. So Tesla really, um, I mean, when when that brand came out, it destroyed uh, the, the long-held belief that it was impossible to invent a brand new car brand yeah. and compete. Uh, and, and, it, and you know what? I still think it's extremely difficult. Tesla against all odds uh, did relatively well. I still don't think its stock <laughs> is worth as much as it is, is it uh, I don't think it's accurate. So I think it's silly that it's that expensive, but still they they defied all odds. So now you have all these companies coming and entering the market. That has to be one of the hardest markets to compete. There's so many barriers. Oh, yeah. There's so many you know so selling I, I cars. A, you got to go what through. Was it is it just Ford and Tesla were the only ones that didn't take a bailout? So I, something like that I back, back in the day. Well, so a couple things. I one I have a theory on why. Tesla is valued so high and why it kind of makes sense, right? Do you guys remember, I forget what uh, company that was that was starting to give you breaks on your insurance because they could track your your patterns, where you move to, your speeds, all these things like that. So I think that of all the, the car companies that are out there, Tesla is going to provide more uh, digital information for advertisers and things like that than any other car company. Now imagine a car that is that is that that that, that digitally ran, right? So that's on mm-hmm. a platform like that. If, you know, he can literally tell you that Justin goes to the grocery store 13 times a month. This yeah. is the short store that he that shops out. Advantage. This is where it's this is where he's where he's at. This is what gas stations he uses. Think of the advertising power. And then you have this massive monitor inside of your car. It's literally like what Mir is doing right they'll, now. They'll inside. be the first to communicate to all the different uh, uh yeah. Oh yeah. Tech so devices ima- and imagine the, sensors and things out there. Imagine when your car becomes an advertising tool sure. that is extremely accurate to your behaviors already that is extremely valuable. So here, so, so that is minority. Report. That is amazing. Um, but I'll I'll give you a little uh, competition to that. So nowadays you buy a brand new car, you plug your phone in, boom, the screen becomes your phone. All of that's already in your phone, not necessarily the car. No, it doesn't really. Not like that. It can. It should. It can be. Like if I go on my if I go on if I plug my phone into you know the the uh, a, a suburban or whatever. It goes to CarPlay. CarPlay comes up. The phone has all that information. The phone then can tell me where I want to go, where I don't want to go. More people, I think. Like think about it this way: when you go and use your your dash or whatever on your car. You probably most likely stick to the phone CarPlay and not necessarily to the the Ford or the Chevy or the Toyota. So maybe interface. so so I could see how that becomes. You know what I'm maybe they they not have a, play. a way to to compete, <laughs> but you're competing with a tech company versus a, you have car companies competing with a tech company on tech stuff. So who do you think has the bigger advantage? There? Oh yeah, yeah. I right. Can, the I the company that, that they have the ability to change the specs on your car when something comes out. Oh, we found out that cars that with a half of an inch lower on their suspension get in less accidents or deal with more shift. So all of a sudden they send that out. Tesla's cars. Oh, all I know, I yeah. know that. Part. I mean, so updates. Are crazy. I used to yeah. train a guy that was very, very high up at Tesla, and I remember, you know, one day I was training him, and he goes, 
oh, cool, my car just got faster. I'm like, what? Yeah. Right. They, they just updated uh, something that now my car goes zero to 60 in like 0.4 seconds faster. I'm like, just like that? Just like, like that. Yeah. yeah over just, the cloud. Right. Yeah. Or get better gas mileage yeah, or yeah. things like that. I mean, those well, things. electric. They, right they have. A, they, yeah, right. Sorry. They, they have better <laughs> or run a battery longer. You yeah, get my, you my yeah, point, yeah, right? Yeah. So they yeah. have they have the tech to be able to figure those things out, integrate it immediately. You're just, you're talking about car companies competing with a tech company. So I know. That, to me, that's why it's valued so high in comparison to like some of these car companies. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mm. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take us to a different topic. Um, you know, lately I've been changing my diet and optimizing things, not for physical strength and performance, but rather for mental uh, performance. Uh, now, usually they're, they're very similar, right? What's best for the brain is best for the body. But when you're talking about maximal performance, then they can, diverge a little bit. So for me in particular, for, for brain sharpness and for performance, typically this is a ketogenic type diet. I'll do lots of fasting. Fasting, I feel sharper. I feel smarter. Both of those things are not best for muscle performance, strength, and, and, and those types of things. And so you you know, I'm, I'm in this position where I'm like, do I want to optimize brain performance or muscle performance? And I think this is a good topic to talk about because there are people who push their bodies to the limit who sometimes want to push their minds to the limit, mm -hmm. and sometimes one means you're going to suffer with the other one. Ketogenic diet does not give me the best strength and best athletic performance, but it oftentimes does make me feel sharp, alert, um, and so does fasting. Fasting, not necessarily the best for performance. Right phenomenal for the way I think. It's good to kind of recognize that going into it so you can wrap your, your brain around it so that way it's like, uh, you know, uh, because it is it, it is going to be frustrating like going back into the gym and you realize like, you know, it is going to affect the performance on some level. Like I uh, would go through periods where I would fast a few times uh, for that month and, uh, you know, it, my, my performance in the gym was a little bit different, uh, you know, versus me being in a surplus or like even being on a bulk, I could feel like a big massive difference in terms of energy and like really you know uh, uh getting the intensity factor up uh quite a bit but it's good to go through these periods to uh really focus on different attributes so i, I do like think that it's it's important now is it th is the theory on that that why you get mental clarity from fasting and the ketogenic diet is because the that ketones is just a cleaner burning source of energy that's the theory and i don't know if this happens to everybody yeah. now studies feels show that way for me it, yeah so so there's a lot of uh, it feels that way for everybody I've talked to anybody yeah. that I know that have ran, ran the diet whether you're you're pro it for losing weight building muscle or if you're using it for those reasons the people that are using it to pay attention to mental clarity and sharpness almost everybody I, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who says they don't notice that yeah so the study studies show that ketones really benefit people with uh, cognitive issues cognitive decline so when you have somebody who has uh, dementia Alzheimer's have them go on a ketogenic diet or supplement with exogenous ketones, they notice improvements in in mental performance. When you're talking about healthy people, the studies are mixed. I'm just speaking of my own personal experience, especially when I fast. If I fast and I do it right, especially if I go into fasting already in ketosis, I am like, even my eyesight feels sharper. It's very strange. I feel like I'm on, uh, almost like I'm on caffeine, but a different type of feeling now that, yeah so there's a, a few different obviously there's the medical ketogenic uh, diet like so what would you say your your macros look like and what are your meals look like uh, for your specific uh, ketogenic diet okay so protein is higher than you would have on the medical uh, ketogenic diet but not super high i don't think i'm eating more than 120 grams yeah. Uh, of protein what, what's today. your source too? Uh, oh yeah, so uh, grass-fed meat is got is my that's my top source for whether I'm ketogenic or not. It digests the best. Um, I feel the best. Least amount of inflammation. Um, and so like t so and then here's the other part. Uh, two or three days a week, I do a fast for most of the day while I'm trying to focus on maximal brain, you know, cognitive, you, you know, that feeling of being alert type performance. So today I'm fasting, for example, excuse me. So tonight I'll go home. Jessica's already preparing some grass-fed tri-tip. So I'll have a nice you know, bit of that. I'll have some avocado with it mm -hmm. um, and have maybe have some nuts. So it's a lot of fat, some protein, um, and the fats that I'm getting are from the, the grass-fed meat. And then that just makes me feel 
Again, mentally sharp. So it's like sometimes I digestion too, for sure. Oh yeah. Oh well, fasting for me is great for yeah. digestion. So it's like I'm either gonna go like, okay, what am I gonna go and, and see what my my strength performance can be? Am I gonna deadlift more than ever, or do I feel like being sharp as hell mentally? You know, doing well on the podcast, writing more content for us, that kind of stuff. Mm. And so right now I'm going in that direction. Have you heard how Ben Greenfield does it? Like he gets the he how he manages to get the benefits of ketones without technically being on a ketogenic diet or fasting, really just the way he manages take ketones? No, just the way he manages his calorie intake and his carbohydrate intake and then how he exercises towards the end of the evening and then has a a, a meal that is just barely gonna fuel him and through by the time he wakes up he's you know, he's he pissing like he's in ketosis. So he does He it. goes in and out. Yeah, he goes in and out. So instead of, cause it, I think there's benefits to that, right? If Keto you, fluid. If you are. <laughs> it's, a new, it's a new genre. <laughs> it's, oh, I, uh, another opportunity uh, for a diet. I'm diet fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good book. I like that. Yeah, uh, let's, yeah. let's write that one. Diet, so. diet, uh. I don't identify with a diet. Because, I, yeah. Because <laughs> I, cause I, do, I do think that there's there's opportunity for people who, uh, and this is what how I encourage it with family and friends that are asking questions about the benefits of fasting or the benefits of ketogenic diet is like, you don't necessarily need to run these things indefinitely. You no, can, I don't think that's a good idea. No, at all. you you can use the you can use all what all the research and study says about ketones and how it's so beneficial and great for us. You can get into ketosis by fasting for twenty four hours. Yeah, mm-hmm. you'll get in there the same as you would if you decided to eat steak only for five days. Right. Yeah. Now the big mistake is that when people do this stuff to try to lose weight, yeah, uh, that's the wrong. Now some people do a ketogenic diet for fat loss because they find it really helps with their appetite. Okay, that's fine. But definitely don't do fasting for fat loss. That's a that's no. a we we call that starving yourself yeah. back in the day. Totally bad relationship with food. None of what I'm doing right now has anything to do with aesthetic or performance goals. Uh, what I'm trying to do with my diet and, and the occasional fasting is everything to do with uh, maximizing mental clarity and mental performance. That's why I'm sharing that uh, on the podcast. Mm. First question is from C. W. Bowserman. If you're not getting, if you're not able to get eight hours of sleep in a row, is it worth it to try to take a nap to make up for it? Well, okay, two things. Mm. First, you can't totally make up for lack of sleep at night with naps, but it does help a lot. Right. Okay, so it's not like you're uh, you're fixing the problem. It's not. It's not. It's it's kind of like a band aid a little bit. But you definitely do get benefits. So it's study- like the, it's like supplements to Whole Foods. Yeah, it's something like you know what I'm so- saying. Like it's it's better than you not right. 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 But then you, Whole Foods are the way to go. Good nights, full nights, the rest. Yeah. So let's let's say you get six hours of sleep and you don't nap, and you compare yourself to take, getting six hours of sleep with a nap. You're going to get better health. You're going to get be more alert, less inflammation if you add the nap. But if you compare that to a full hour, eight hours of sleep at night. It's not going to be uh, as good now, Adam. When you had uh, your, your Max is now, um, I mean, he's still he's still a little guy, but he was just born not that long ago. Crazy how fast time flies, by the way. Right. Um, sleep is obviously one of the first things that is just not the best when you first have a baby. Were you finding yourself napping? Were you doing anything like that? I actually didn't nap at all, and I'm actually uh, you're putting me on a front street here. Uh, I'm actually not a good example in this because. Um, it was only a short while. The, the 30 days where I was home with Katrina mm-hmm. uh, was the only real 30 days that my sleep was really interrupted. Um, she's taking taking that on completely herself. So she has managed. And once I once I read to him at night after his bath time, and and I put him down sometimes. So we go back and forth on who puts him down. But after I put him down, or she puts him down, uh, the whole night shift, like she has managed that completely. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I'm a bad example of somebody who's like like your typical fathers who like you know talk about not getting sleep all the time. Um, but when I when I was, uh, you know, I could I would adjust my my eating habits and then also whether how I was training based off of that. So there has been nights so I was, hasn't I haven't been 100 percent perfect with nights since we've had Max and especially in the first 30 days. Uh, during that time, I was modifying my workout. So I was doing a lot of more like recuperative stuff, working in. I mean, I was not training intensely when he, those those first three days because I already knew that I wasn't mm-hmm. getting great sleep. Like to go in the gym and hammer the shit out of myself too, not ideal. I know they recommend to new moms uh, to like nap when the baby naps to help make up for the lack of sleep, uh, you know, at, at night. 
Um, here's the other part of naps that are awesome. Uh, forget about making up for poor sleep. It does help, like I said, but forget that for a second. Naps on top of your good sleep that you get at night has muscle building benefits. Uh, you know, bodybuilders and strength athletes and strongmen naps in maps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's on fire. Yeah. Uh, have have utilized a mid afternoon nap um, for a long time and have found they've all said that this is great for building muscle. This is great for recovery, but they need to be short. You don't want to go to. You and don't want to go. I you, was going to speak to that because I don't know if you guys have done a, a stint of a nap where it was like an hour or half hour or 10 minutes. I always prefer the 10 minute naps because then you wake up and you're a little more energized versus if I go a little bit too long, it almost ruins the rest of my day in terms of me being more drowsy. Well, yeah. Or you have the counter that well, sometimes if I get like, if I were to get an hour or a two hour nap, in the daytime, it screws up my sleep for the next night. Right, yeah. exactly. The so night. Then, then I can't fall asleep exactly. at you know nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night. I'm wide awake till two in the morning. So sometimes I will, ha if I have a bad night's rest, I'll modify my workout, pay attention to my eating because I also notice I have cravings on that time, and then just tough it out until the evening. And then I go yeah. to bed and get a really. It's good only when rest. I have maybe a few days where I'm strung together where I've had really terrible sleep where I'll probably end up in the middle of the day just being like, look, I'm just like so ineffective right now. <laughs> I have to just shut it down. So I, I've got this down to a science, okay? So I love using naps to, uh, to to reinvigorate myself and to feel better for the late, the second half of the day, you know, when I want to give good attention to the kids and to Jessica when I'm home from work. So anything more than about 30 minutes, I wake up and I feel like uh, out of it, maybe bad mood, a little groggy. If it's an hour and I wake up, I'm like a zombie until it's time to go to bed. So for me, it's between 20 to 30 minutes. And here's here's what I do. Here's my hack, right? I go home. I get my headphones. I don't go in a totally dark room because I don't want to go so deep in sleep that, I, again, I wake up like uh, uh, half asleep. Do you do like a brain FM? A hundred percent. I put my headphones on. I go brain FM. 20, 30 minutes. It probably takes me about five to seven minutes to fall asleep. I have no idea. All I know is, is about 30 minutes later, I wake up and I feel uh, alert. I feel good. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't interfere. You're such you get in that RAM a lot quicker. I feel. You're, well, so, yeah. you're such a bad example though, dude. Yeah. You're the guy, like this dude. Can, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, right? This, we're not even off the plane. Anytime we're in a car. The plane hasn't, plane. yeah, plane, a car, doesn't matter. This dude could sleep anywhere. We're yeah, sitting yeah. on the couch. We're all watching TV. Kids running around. Just, just, he yeah. just falls asleep. And the minute you go to mess with him, he wakes up. Yeah. You know, like, like, uh, know, like, like a spidey. This is a weird, a <laughs> like weird. Like a soldier. Yeah, like a weird hack that you have. Like, Dude, listen, the Brain FM, put it on 20, 30 minutes yeah, later. Yeah, I need that. You sleep and you wake up and you're and you're great. Yeah. You're, you're totally good. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it takes me a little long. And again, I don't do it in a totally dark room because then I get too deep in sleep and it's hard to, to wake up. Next question is from Shai G. If you find yourself having a hard time eating enough food throughout the day due to a busy life, what are some ways to implement more food beside protein powders? Do you use larger, higher calorie meals or snacks? Well, besides the larger, higher calorie meals, which you could totally do, that's really easy. Um, high calorie snacks are are an easy way to do this. Nuts are phenomenal for this. You know, it's funny they talk about how nuts are healthy, and yes, they are. They are healthy, but you have no idea how fast. Most people have no idea how fast the calories add up with nuts. Like a a serving of it's almonds nuts. is like 12, yeah. you know? Yeah. And if most people end up eating about five, uh, you know, servings at a sitting, mm -hmm. nuts for me, one of the best ways to increase uh, calories throughout the day besides protein powders. Protein powders is another one of my favorites. No, it, a serving size is actually more like 23 or 25, but the point is that it, it creeps up quick and I love to do that, Sal. Like I would, at the end of a meal, it's really easy to eat 20 almonds. Totally. You know, it's not, and and then it's also an easy way to control. So I used to get those little tiny, uh, uh, little sandwich bag. They're like not a sandwich bag. A sandwich wouldn't fit in them. You've seen them. Have you guys it's seen like them? The, the snack bags. Yeah, the little they're little yeah. snack little bags snack that bag. only fit like a couple ounces. And then I'd weigh out them in a serving, like Sal's talking about. And it's that a would bag. that <laughs> it looks kind of like that. Yes, <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, that's something that I would do after the meals. The other thing, uh, rice is so easy for me to take down. So. 
I bo- I would boost my rice. I'm eating two cups with my meat or my meal that I'm having. Now, it. is this two cu- cooked two cups? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah, which that's a lot of rice. It is. Yeah. Throw some bone broth in there too sometimes. There right? you go. Yeah. yeah, you could do the bone broth with it like we talked about, the protein rice. So, I mean, that is something that I think is an easy thing. My body digests it quick. Here's what I have found uh, when I, all these times that I've had to really boost calories. The mistake that I made consistently over and over again was thinking that I need to get this calorie intake, and then I would choose these like really high-calorie foods all the time, thinking that that was the best approach. And what I would find is it would fill me up, and then I'd be like 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and my goal was 5,000 calories, and I'm only at 2,000. And now I've got like the bat, you know, the last three hours of eating, I've got to try and get 3,000 calories. It's, I'm screwed. So I had to I had to get ahead of the game. I had to do it early. And eating foods that were actually not super high in fat like my oatmeal oatmeal and fruit and th- nuts like for bre- and and uh, berries and strawberries like that for breakfast. Man, I was I was hungry. Oh, yeah, and those I, fruit smoothies or uh, like fruit and man, veggie smoothies. I was great. I was hungry a half hour later and ready to eat again. So making sure that I'm eating meals that promote hunger and not fill me all up because sometimes you chase the calories, thinking that that's what you that that's the way you need to go, and then that that calorie dense meal ends up filling you up so much that you don't you're not hungry again an hour or two hours later. Where leaner type meals made me keep eating. So then when I hit midday, I had a good, I was already halfway or more than halfway through my calories. And then I have for dinner, I have the ribeye steak. You know, I eat the the foods that are a little bit higher in calorie or higher that are high that are also more satiating towards the evening to boost the calories yeah. versus doing that early in the day. I, I got a I got a, a calorie hack for rice besides cooking it in bone broth, which adds protein. You ever uh, put butter in your rice after yeah. you cook it? Oh, Ooh, yeah. I said I never did that. Jessica taught me that. Yeah, put, put, put a butter nice, on everything. Put it. Yeah. I know. I don't I, exactly. Uh, I'm so yeah, disappointed that's a, in myself. That's an easy way to do it. Nice big, you know, tablespoon of butter in your hot rice. Let it melt. Mix up. Add some salt. Oh, yeah. So good. Yep. Yeah. Or cheese. Next question is from Jose M two seventy nine. What's your advice for someone who used to be chubby and is now scared to put on weight due to body dysmorphia? Okay, so uh, so again, I'm 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 not an expert in uh, you know the psychology behind body dysmorphia. I have a lot of experience with it just through training clients, and in my experience, the most effective thing I could do as a trainer for somebody who has any type of body dysmorphia, whether it be you know I need to build more muscle, I'm too skinny, or I'm afraid to gain weight, or any of that stuff, is I would take their focus off of how they looked and focus completely on performance. Mm-hmm. It was always the most effective thing that I found, again, as a trainer. So when someone would come to me and we'd have these conversations about body dysmorphia, I would say, okay, we're not going to weigh you. We're not going to test your body fat. Uh, I don't want you to look in the mirror to gauge your progress. All we're going to keep track of and focus on is your reps, how much weight you can lift, how fast you can move. All your strength metrics. Your, 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 your work uh, load, how much more exercises we could do, your total volume. And then what ends up happening is a person moves their focus towards performance. And here's the thing. All of the, all of the, the behaviors that we have that are negative around body dysmorphia, it's hard to do them when you're, when you're looking at your performance. So in other mm-hmm. words, it's, it's hard to starve yourself and get stronger and improve your performance. Mm -hmm. So what it would do is it would just move their focus for long enough time to where they started to really enjoy the performance gains. And then we could sometimes go back to aesthetics or sometimes not at all. I I, I can't tell you how many times I had clients with body dysmorphia that loved the performance so much that they never went back to really focus. And, And then they would notice, holy cow, I look good. Because I'm just focused on on my performance. I, I think too. I, I'm always having like the and this same thing, right? So I'm like I'm not an expert in this, but yet we've this is a very very common and like there's a wide spectrum on this on how extreme it is, and I, I'm I'm always reminding this person that you know you, the body that you're trying to build, right? This is it's the super body, the super car that we're trying to build, and right now I want to build the most powerful engine that I can. 
I care more about that before we start worrying about the aesthetics, the body, the frame of the car. Like, let's build the most powerful engine we possibly can. And that is what we're trying to do when we're trying to build muscle. Because the more muscle that we can put on your body, the faster your metabolism is going to work, which is only going to make it that much easier for us to lean out and to build this physique that you want. So keeping them focused on the goal is to speed up our metabolism and th and then focusing on strength, like Sal is saying. I'm communicating that over and over so many different ways to get that across to them that stop worrying about the aesthetics right now of what we look like. Like the long game, we're going to get there. Don't worry about that. But we have to first lay the foundation or build the engine. And that's what we're trying to accomplish by focusing on the strength, adding the calories, in and building muscle, don't get caught up in the inches, the scale on the way, what, even what you may look like in the mirror. This is the long game that we're trying to do, and that's why you've hired yeah. me. And, and my theory around this really is, yeah. you know, and I've I had, you know, uh, I've experienced body dysmorphia personally, okay? And there is an obsessive component to it in terms of the, the thought process where you kind of become a little obsessed with how you look, and this is what you think about all the time. And when I moved that thought process from how I looked to performance, I was still a little obsessive with my thought process, but it was in a, in a, a healthier uh, direction. Um, and, and again, take the focus off of your body and how it looks. Um, there was a gentleman that uh, hung out with us at one of our last uh, live events who was asking me about this. And I told him to, he was saying, Oh, I weigh myself. You know, twice, you know, every morning um, and every night. So I know how much, you know, water weight I'm gaining and I'm really keeping track and I have this thing. And, you know, eventually he told me he's got a little bit of body dysmorphia. And I told him, I said, take your scale and I want you to put it in the closet and don't use it anymore. And he freaked out. And I said, just mm -hmm. trust me on this. Take the scale, put it in the closet. Don't focus, don't weigh yourself at all. I'll give you a time frame because I know you're freaking out. So let's say 60 days from now, two months, you can weigh yourself again. In the meantime, I just want you to track your strength, your sets, your reps, your performance. And he came back. He emailed me, you know, uh, several times. He's like, uh, I, I'm getting stronger. I'm feeling better. I really want to weigh myself, but I'm not. I know you said not to or whatever. Well, anyway, at the end of 60 days, he got on the scale and the guy's body improved by him not focusing on how he looked and just focusing on his performance. I just think it's a healthier mentality in general. Like even if somebody's coming in to right. just completely focus on even aesthetics. Even if they don't have dysmorphia, right? Yeah, even if they don't have dysmorphia, it's just a, a better way to treat yourself. And, and I think we always speak to this uh, in terms of like punishing yourself by working out. Like we got to get rid of that mentality, and that's definitely one, a component is viewing your body in a certain light uh, and bringing that energy into uh, working on yourself. And I really just feel that uh, you know focusing on strength and actual tangibles, it's way more objective. Like we got to get out of the subjective of like I look this way, I'm holding water, and this. Uh, it you know it becomes a, a neurotic uh, obsession eventually, uh, even if you don't realize that it is. And so I just think if if people were able to kind of shift that mentality because you're going to get to your goal you're going to get to your goal by focusing on strength you will get there and you'll make our alterations uh to to make that uh happen and to achieve that so uh, your body's going to reflect it uh, eventually next question is from kjsc13 i'm interested in working in the fitness field i had planned to change careers but i recently had a child I'm nervous to gamble on a new career path in my current situation, but I'm very passionate about fitness. Is it possible to start it as a side hustle to safely test the waters? Or am I stuck until I grow a pair and jump in with both feet? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I have two thoughts on this. Uh, one, I understand your position with, with uh, having a child. You know, when we started mind pump, I was a, a, in a different position than when I had started uh, other businesses. You know, when I opened my wellness studio, I was, I think, 23 years old. Um, you know, I didn't have any kids. Um, and so the way I would do things is I would go all in because in my opinion, you don't know if something can work unless you give it your best. Mm -hmm. You know, if you give it half your best and it doesn't work, is it because it wasn't meant to be or is it because you weren't able to give it your full attention. And so I would always give my full attention. But then I had kids, uh, you know, two children and a mortgage and all these other responsibilities. 
and we started Mind Pump, and it was different. It was different for me because now I was responsible for other people, to, and I didn't want to take such a big risk and potentially harm, you know, people that are dependent on me. And so we did kind of have to do it uh, on the side. So it is possible to te- test the waters as a side hustle, but you're not going to get nearly the performance you would get or nearly the the answers that you're looking for unless you jump uh, all the way in. And so I don't know what the right answer is for you. I don't know your whole financial situation. I don't know if you have savings that'll carry you for you know X amount of months while you're figuring things out. I don't know those things. So it's really it's a tough thing, uh, a tough decision. Now, if you're somebody and you're like in your 20s, like, hey, I just you know graduated college and I don't have any kids, I'm not married, and I'm still living at my, living at my parents' house, my advice would be go all in. You have nothing to lose, go for it all the way. But because you have a child, um, it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little more nuanced. I would still caution that person. Uh, I, I'm glad you shared that story about you with Mind Pump because it's true. I mean, Mind Pump really did start like a side hustle. Um, it was a passion project. Um, we weren't focused on we needed to make money at all. It was uh, something that we all felt passionate about and, and wanted to test and see, you know, can we do this? So absolutely, you can do that. The reason why I would caution you, and I would even caution the young kid who doesn't have kids and has all time, it's a weird fucking time for our industry. Yeah, It's it's a weird time for us. I mean, we, uh, to, very uncertain. we we have lots of conversations uh, off mic about the direction of this company and trying to understand and figure out what exactly is going to unfold in the next 12 months and what is the space going to look like. I mean, we they're already doing surveys on people that are saying that, you know, 25 plus percent of them will never return to a gym. That's a big chunk of people. So the landscape is definitely changing. It's it's changed in uh, our two decades that we've been involved in it. I mean, we look at us now. We were brick and mortar, you know, owning either facilities or managing and running them, and all one on one with clients. Like we don't do any of that anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's it, it's definitely evolved in our time, and I think we are in the middle of it evolving again. And so. I, I caution anybody who is thinking about moving into this space without really thinking about like where and how you how you want I, I do think uh and following our, I think there's value in this like I, I get asked this by a lot of trainers that are right now that if you are not investing in uh, written content or virtual content regardless if you want to be an in-person trainer or run a franchise studio it doesn't matter to me uh we live in this this digital virtual streaming world now uh, there's a ton of value in starting to uh, acquire real estate in in all these different mediums right now, regardless of what part of the space that you want to belong in. I think that is a must. I think that mm-hmm. is something that if you're consi- and you can do that on the side while you're doing other things. That that to me, uh, it, it, when I think of the things that have made Mind Pump really successful or that why we have continued to have success, a lot of it is not the stuff that you listen to on the podcast. You listen to the podcast, you enjoy the show, You maybe you identify with one of us, you like that, or we present really good information. Probably Justin. That's Yeah, probably yeah. Justin. That there's Love a, you guys. There's a reason, of course, why you keep tuning into the podcast, but the podcast is, is just one part of this business. The, the other stuff that we don't talk about is the amount of, of work that goes into all the digital assets that we have, all the written content that's out there. That's really what that's the that's the engine of this this beast. And so those are things that you you definitely should invest your time in if you're considering going in this. But, you know, proceed with caution because it's a weird time even for us. I know. I mean, I really didn't have like anywhere to go with this question based off of what you just described. It's so strange the landscape now and it's it's ever changing uh and to see how companies right now are trying to pivot and adjust and like every gym has to have an online component now. That is like a new standard that didn't exist before all this. And so it's not the same old formula isn't going to apply. Like I just go to a gym, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get all these clients. Like that whole thing, you have to just kind of reassess like what that's going to look like. And I do think though, there's obviously there's going to be a uh, space for all this and like an opportunity in the health and fitness space is just going to look a bit different. So maybe being patient to see what kind of those opportunities pop up, like if it's 
for a tech company that's now promoting, uh, you, you know, virtual trainers and they provide a platform for you to speak and start acquiring clients virtually, uh, that might make sense. Uh, and they might be able to sort of like provide a turnkey option for that. Really the best thing for you to do right now is to get educated as much as possible. Uh, you know, try to do these online certifications like a CPPS or like one of these that, uh, you know, we definitely put, uh, I mean, we, we, we definitely like love what they're doing with that. Uh, you know, FRC, something like that. Just, just try to kind of really understand the environment uh, you're dealing with right now. Yeah, it's. Um, but I will say this: Look, uh, the de- although the fitness landscape is changing, the demand for help in yeah. health and fitness it's not going to go away. Is growing. Um, I just read something this morning. No, it's just how it's delivered. Right, and I just read this morning: twelve percent of Americans. And this is based off of blood tests. Uh, you know, looking at blood markers and waist circumference. Okay, so based off those numbers, they estimate that about twelve percent of Americans have good metabolic health, 12%. Wow. So that leaves 88% terrible. of the country um, is in dire need of a fitness professional's services, a good fitness professional services. Here's the other thing that I noticed as a trainer, right? Uh, when I, towards the end of my career, after I'd been training people for a long time, you know, my, my personal training rates back then were – you know, anywhere between 80 to $120 an hour. So it wasn't cheap, right? People would hire me and then they'd pay me every month for years. Okay. I'm talking, you know, some clients I had for 15 years paying me this, you know, $85, $100 an hour rate. Now, these are smart people. These are successful people. They always found so much value in what I was able to provide to them that I probably became one of the largest expenses in their life aside from their mortgage. Think about that for a second. That's the power that fitness and health can provide people when delivered properly. So, and I'm going to talk about the current landscape and a lot of this is going to be my prediction because it's still up in the air, but I predict the at-home workout market and the virtual fitness market is only going to, it was already exploding. It's going to continue to explode. I don't think the demand is going to go down at all. I think we're going to see an increased demand for virtual fitness or for fitness for children as schools continue to be, you know, out of service oh, absolutely. As, and as they start to reduce their funds for PE and physical fitness. And now we're starting to see children being affected by poor health. More and more parents are pulling their funds together. I know this. I was just in a phone call yep. uh, last night with a group of parents mm-hmm. and we're talking about what we're going to do with our kids because California schools aren't in. And I'm like, hey, do you guys, would you guys like a fitness component yeah. for Physical the Physical education. Yeah. And they're like, absolutely. Do you know any good trainers? We would love to pull our money together and pay them. Right. So you got five parents willing to pay a trainer, you know, $100 an hour to take their kids through I love some the, kind of I a workout. I love that space right now. Oh, it's amazing. So, and you look, you just had a child. I guarantee you, I know this already. I already know this before and probably still now, but I knew trainers, moms who just had babies who then service the new mom uh, market in mm-hmm, fitness mm-hmm. and they would all take their babies together and meet at the park or whatever and do stroller work- workouts. Yes. And all that stuff. Strides. Yeah. 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 Huge. So th- this market, it, we're saying caution because pay attention, watch, you know, try and be smart about it. But this fitness yeah. and health is not going anywhere. The demand is only growing. And if you look at the health of the modern world and how it's declining, uh, Western medicine has no answers. All of the answers lie in the fitness and health space. We are the ones that hold the answers to the chronic health problems that are plaguing us today. It's not the doctors. It's not the hospitals. There's no drugs. There's no medicines. You need it's, to build a resilient body. That's it right there, 100%. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find us all on Instagram, including Doug. You can find Doug at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump the Sal, of and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Never in real life do you do something like this. Uh, 15 reps, then you rest. Then done. And then you're done, and then you go ahead. <laughs> Could you imagine if your dad looked over at you and you shoveled 15, and then you stopped for a minute and a half, and then yeah. you shoveled 15? How many more reps? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No one ever does that. You don't sweep the garage, and you're sweeping, yeah. and then you- Reps s- are irrelevant. Right, they are irrelevant, and this is where it has 